uh, really easy because what we've done is we've already done the difficult parts earlier. So while doing areas like taxes or cash flows, we've already learned what balance sheet is. But we'll just go through it quickly again so that when you read your speed will be faster. This is the first syllabus which talks about components of balance sheet and uses of balance sheet in financial analysis. So of course we have something called as assets, we have something called as liabilities and we have something called as equity. Now I'm not expecting, don't expect me to explain them again. But then of course what you would definitely know by this time is that this is your equity and this is your liability and these are all your assets. So we can always say equity plus liability is equal to your assets. Various formats of balance sheet. So the one that we typically prepare which is called as box format. Now a lot of people who work on, uh, who have studied either in US or Australia or Japan and then they come to India. Uh, this is a perennial problem that they face that a lot of countries they would write assets here and liabilities here and what we typically do in India is we write liabilities here and assets here but then this format of preparing balance sheet is called as box format or we typically call this as horizontal format of balance sheet. If I flip this, if I put assets or if I put liabilities at the top and assets at the bottom then it would be vertical format. The intuition would be same, it's just that my presentation would be different. So we call this as vertical format or at times we call this as a report format. Okay. So once the topic is over, I'll show, show you a few balance sheets. So this is the account format. Just to remember, you can have a box like this and report format is, this is how it would look like. Classified balance sheet means that you would classify each and every item. That is all current assets would be clubbed together. All fixed assets would typically clubbed into gross block so on and so forth. How assets and liabilities arise from accrual process? Can anyone tell me the answer for this? How do we get assets and liabilities from accrual process? Yes. If you receive revenue in advance, which you have not earned, it would be a liability on earned revenue. And then if you have not received revenue which you had earned, then it would be a asset, we typically call it as accounts receivable. If you pay expense in advance, it would be a asset, prepaid expenses. And if you delay payment of your expenses, then it would be a liability. So because of this accrual system of accounting, we would have some assets or some liabilities. Comparing current assets with non-current assets and liabilities. So I'm again skipping this. Uh, okay, in fact, we can spend some time on the first definition here. See, current assets include cash and other assets that are likely to be converted into cash or used up within one year or one operating cycle, whichever is greater. Now, though a lot of accounting definitions would typically use this one year, see what you need to know is that for certain companies, let's say a realty company, land is and ideally land should be inventory, but then not necessary that land would be converted into cash within one year, because for them, for business where you have to uh, invest for two years or three years, wait for your project to get completed, you might not be able to convert that into cash. And that is the reason why we have one year or operating cycle whichever is higher. So what it means is what operating cycle is, when you start with inventory, you process it on your sales, you sell it so that it becomes accounts receivable. And then these guys will pay you so that what you get is cash, with this cash you purchase inventory again. So this one cycle, the time that is taken to finish this one cycle is typically called as operating cycle. So when we do working capital in corporate finance, we will spend a lot of time here. But at this stage, one year or operating cycle, whichever is greater. Skipping the easier parts. We've already done historical cost. 
we know what fair value is. Okay. Now, this particular LOS is about investments and it is an investment in financial assets. So what it means is that I am a manufacturing firm but I might have purchased some bonds or some equity shares of few other companies. So these investments are classified into three categories. The first one are called as HTM, the next category is called as AFS and the last category is called as trading. You can write down this with me. HTM is held to maturity. AFS is available for sale and trading is of course trading securities. Now see on what basis I will classify my investments into these categories. I will classify them depending on what is my intention to do, what is my intention to do with these assets. So if I have a bond and if I purchase this bond and maturity of this bond is 5 years and I want to hold on to this bond for next 5 years then I will classify that bond into HTM held to maturity. If I purchase an equity security and I want to hold on to equity security till its maturity then it would be if I want to hold on to the security till maturity there is no maturity so then can I put equity into HTM since there is no maturity I cannot put equity security into HTM category that means equity has to be either AFS or trading so if my intention with equity security is I want to sell it immediately and make profit it goes into trading and if not then it goes into AFS because I don't have any other choice so AFS is that I will hold on to them now and then I will decide in future what I want to do with them Whereas trading is that I want to sell them immediately and I want to make profit. So these are available for sale but I would sell them probably when I find appropriate opportunity to sell them. So now the treatment is you can probably write down that here we can have only bonds. Here we can have bonds as well as equity. And here we will have bonds as well as equity. But typically we do not put bonds into this category. But we can have bonds plus equity in this category. No, not necessary. It's the management who needs to decide what is the intention. Generally, yes, because they will have limited maturity. So, on balance sheet, held to maturity securities are always shown on amortized cost. AFS is shown at fair value and trading securities are shown at fair value. I will explain these words later on. You can write them down as of now. On income statement, we take only realized income. Here we take only realized income and here we take realized plus unrealized income. On the balance sheet, we have a section called OCI in our equity. We will not have anything here. We will have unrealized income and we will have nothing here. Which part should I read? This part. Realize and unrealize both. Realized as well as unrealized income. What's for the? Held to maturity, this is amortized cost. Realized income. Other comprehensive income. OCI is other comprehensive income. It's a part of equity on management. Are you done writing? Should I start explaining now? I am just reading it one more time in case if you got confused with my handwriting. Balance sheet, amortized cost, fair value, fair value. 
इनकम स्टेटमेंट रियलाइज इनकम रियलाइज इनकम रियलाइज प्लस अनरियलाइज बोथ ओसीआई नथिंग अनरियलाइज इनकम नथिंग सी लेट्स से वी परचेस अ बॉन्ड एंड दिस बॉन्ड वॉज अ जीरो कूपन बॉन्ड सो वी परचेज दिस बॉन्ड फॉर सेवेंटी रुपीज एंड आफ्टर थ्री इयर्स दिस बॉन्ड विल पे दी फेस वैल्यू विच इज हंड्रेड दी वाइटीएम इन दी मार्केट on the date of issuance of this bond was something that we would require we will be required to find out so can you find out what would be the vitm of this bond the quantity 12.62 please do the calculations and avoid error 5 Done. So okay. now, at the end of year one, well, let's say I purchase this bond. I decided that I want to hold it on to the maturity for next three years. This is time zero. I invest this for seventy. At the end of year one, I'm preparing my financial statement. I read my chart. It says that on balance sheet it is to be shown an amortized cost on income statement. I have to show only realized income. So, what should be my income in my income statement? Because this bond is not going to pay me anything. It's a zero coupon bond. I have invested seventy. It will give me hundred in three years. But at the end of year one, it will not give me anything. So, my realized income is zero. Is my realized income zero in year one? Yes. How many of you think no? Yes, Paridi, why? See, realized does not mean received in cash. Realized means the income which has been earned. So now we've already done understanding long-term liabilities. Please tell me that what will be. the value of liability in the books of the company at the end of year 1 78.83 and what will be the value of liability at the end of year 2 value of bond liability at any point of time is present value of future cash flows <coughs> discounted at ytm on the date of issuance future cash flow is 100 at the end of year 1 there are two years remaining So 100 is the future value, 2 is the N, 12.62 is the I Y. At the end of year 2, how much? 88.79. 88.79. At the end of year 3, <coughs> it will be 100. So in my books, this is how my liability is going to increase. What it means for a bondholder is that though it is not being paid to him, he is actually earned 8.83 in year 1. And this 8.83 would be nothing but 70 into 12.62 percent. You can check this calculation. So what I would say is that the amortized cost of my bond, which is to be shown on the balance sheet, this would not be 70. This would be 78.83, and realized income would be 8.83. Have you followed this? Do you want me to repeat this again? So you purchase a zero coupon bond; it is not paying you any coupons, but that does not mean that you are not going to earn anything. You are earning it; it is just that it is not being paid to you as of now. So a seventy rupee bond will become seventy eight in year one, eighty eight in year two, and hundred in year three. So when you have classified this bond as HTF, and you are required to show your balance sheet this bond at amortized cost, you will show it at seventy eight point eight three, and then that eight point eight three would be shown as income on the income statement. Which would be shown as in interest income, but of course this has not been, this is not a realized income. We have not received that in cash. Are we clear? Now, let's say you purchase an equity security for hundred rupees. We are moving on to AFS. We are done with HTM. At the end of the year, this equity security is one hundred and thirty rupees, and during the year it paid you a dividend of. 
10 rupees. At what price should I show this on my balance sheet? On my balance sheet, I will show this equity security at 130 because available for sale securities are shown at fair value. Fair value, fair value means the market value. What should be the amount of income that should be shown on the income statement? It would be only 10, which is my realized income. But since from 100 I have shown my asset as 130, my assets have increased, corresponding liability needs to increase somewhere. So that would be increase in my reserves, which would be called as OCI, other comprehensive income, and that increase would be how much? 30. This treatment is to be given for available for sale securities. Uh, the closing price of the security on the uh, end of accounting will be shown or the average price closing price. The average price was for treasury stock matter. It ends there. We will use the closing price, which is the fair value. Okay, should we move on? Now instead of AFS had the security been trading. There on balance sheet I will show it at what price? 130. Our income statement I will show? 40. Realized as well as unrealized income. Realized income of 10. Unrealized income of 30. 100 rupees stock became 130. But though it is in my income, it's not realized yet because tomorrow it might change. So this is unrealized income. I will show entire 40 here. In my OCI, I would not show anything. So in case if you are getting confused as to how it would look from a balance sheet perspective. See, this is your balance sheet here. This is your income statement. 100 rupees stock has become 130. So, since you are showing on this balance sheet at 130, you are increasing 30 on your asset side. Assuming this is your balance sheet, you are increasing 30 here. But then you are also increasing 30 on the liability side, which is in the form of reserves. Then, you are showing 10 as income. So, this 10 as income, which is being shown here, and eventually this income will come on to your reserves. So, you are increasing 10 here. Second effect is your cash because you received dividends, so your cash was, must have increased by 10. So, again, that effect 40 increasing here, 40 increasing on this side. As far as trading security is concerned, you are increasing 30 here as the value of asset. From 100, you are making it as 130. You are increasing 10 here as dividend received which would increase your cash. Entire income is 40 which is going on the income side and effectively it will come on to the liability side. So again 40 is increasing here on the liability side. So again the effect is same. Should we move on? Okay. So I will uh, 